Tributes to former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who died today, his profound influence on the country. Also on this Thursday night, for-profit group homes accused of targeting Indigenous children to make more money. They were legitimately a paycheck. The alarming claims in a global news investigation. A stampede of the starving. Israel accused of shooting civilians rushing to an aid convoy. Newly released mysterious audio. The banging sounds from the doomed Titan submersible that gave hope the crew was alive. And there's no sugarcoating this sour experience. Absolutely sucked. The weak Willy Wonka themed event police were called to. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There is breaking news tonight about Brian Mulroney, a man who served as Canada's 18th Prime Minister. His daughter, Caroline Mulroney, announced today that he died peacefully, surrounded by family. Reaction is coming in from across party lines. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tweeting, Brian Mulroney loved Canada. I'm devastated to learn of his passing. He never stopped working for Canadians and he always sought to make this country an even better place to call home. We will have more reaction in just a moment, but first, Eric Sorensen looks at the life of a proud Quebecer from Bay Como and a lifelong Conservative. A brand new day for this wonderful Canada. He reached the highest heights and the deepest depths in politics. It's a sad day for Canada. But Brian Mulroney's impact on this country was profound. As a teenager, Mulroney met and was impressed with Prime Minister John Diefenbaker. Charming and ambitious, Mulroney's first political run was for the job Deef once held, the progressive conservative leadership. He lost to a young MP, Joe Clark. A victory for all of us. Clark was elected prime minister, but lost the job after nine months back to Pierre Trudeau. Mulroney, with a second chance, seized the Tory leadership from Clark. Brian Mulroney, 1,584 and in the next election made short work of Liberal leader John Turner. This is wrong for Canada. Scoring a debate knockout over political appointments. You had an option, sir, to say no, and you chose to say yes I... to the old attitudes and the old stories of the Liberal Party. That, sir, if I may say respectfully, that is not good enough for Canadians. <laughs> Mulroney assembled progressive conservatives, Quebec nationalists, and Western populists into a political juggernaut that swept to victory. National unity, one Canada. As Prime Minister, Mulroney, the consummate dealmaker, would undertake two great negotiations, to bring Quebec into the Constitution and to bring about free trade with the United States. Our guest today is Mr. Brian Mulroney. His outreach to Washington was a success though his close friendship with President Reagan rankled many Canadians, even when celebrating their Irish roots. Free trade. Free trade brought another bruising campaign against Turner. I happen to believe that you've sold us out. You do what? not have a monopoly what? on patriotism. What? What? Mulroney won a second term. He remains the only Conservative leader since John A. Macdonald to win back-to-back -back majorities and his vision for Canada-U.S. relations would redefine this country's economic future. Brian Mulroney was a, a visionary a leader. Mulroney convinced Canadians of the merits of free trade with the United States. A la prochaine. He came to uh, power in Canada wanting to do things. It changed the mentality of, of, of Canadian uh, business people. It opened up their minds to new uh, new areas of competition. Si but at home, Mulroney's deal-making skills could not bring about national unity. The Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown referendum, both failures, left the Prime Minister in tears. Quel grand pays, le Canada. Mulroney's conservative coalition splintered. Quebec nationalists, led by Lucien Bouchard, broke away. Western conservatives, like Stephen Harper, left to support the new Reform Party with Preston Manning. <laughs> Mulroney retired only months before his party, under Kim Campbell, suffered the greatest political collapse in Canadian history. Gee, I'm glad I didn't sell my car. And Mulroney's troubles weren't over yet. I've done nothing wrong, and I have absolutely nothing to hide. An independent inquiry found that after Mulroney left office, he received thousands of dollars, cash in envelopes, from fundraiser Carl Heinz Schreiber, a lobbyist in Ottawa's purchase of Airbus jets. The financial dealings 
between Mr. Schreiber and Mr. Mulroney were inappropriate. Mulroney's achievements were many, if also controversial. A conservative, he cancelled the national energy program and privatized Air Canada. We must work to... But he was also a progressive conservative on the environment. And economic growth, which does not destroy our magnificent environment. And on abortion. It has a special kind of implication for, for Canadian women. Mulroney stood up to fellow Conservatives Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher opposing apartheid in South Africa, for which Nelson Mandela greatly admired Mulroney's leadership. And while no one liked his new GST, it was a more transparent tax, and future governments kept it. We believe that it's in the national interest to do this, otherwise we wouldn't do it. He was uh, relentless, uh, and he was very talented. He had this uh, soaring ambition since childhood and he was able to exercise it to reach the very top to be a major player on the stage. What do you miss when you leave? Well, you miss the adulation. Mulroney was always sensitive to media coverage. All oh, those lovely editorials every morning. <laughs> but he lost neither his Irish charm nor his humor, even about his own popularity. But most of all, we, we miss the, the gratitude of the voters. In the highs and lows of Canada's political history, Few have traveled steeper ups and downs than Brian Mulroney. And our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson is with me. Mercedes, politics can be a brutal business, but moments like this remind us that politicians, no matter their stripe, can recognize dedication to public service. Give us a sense of some of the reaction coming in. Donna, all of the reaction, regardless of party lines, is, is one of deep sadness. Brian Mulroney is somebody who politicians uh, and many Canadians held in deep affection. Regardless of the controversies or triumphs of his time as Prime Minister, he had become really a statesman for Canada. In fact, he advised Prime Minister Justin Trudeau when he was dealing with Donald Trump on NAFTA. So one to look at the whole country and not just at the politics. We heard from Prime Minister Jean Chrétien just a few minutes ago on Parliament Hill with his memories of Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. We would tease each other. You would poke fun at me, I would poke fun at him. And, uh, you know, we will, uh, you know, as I say, it is, we have to take, not to take ourselves too seriously. We have to take the job very seriously. But life is life and we all do our best. We can disagree what is the best for you and the best for him. And it was not difficult. I never had very, better this personal discussion with him. Sir, what was it? And Donna, to share with you just some of the reaction we're hearing from Parliament Hill and beyond, Peter McKay worked very closely well, with uh, Brian Mulroney. He says that he positively shaped Canada and the world, and of course notes that he had the biggest majority government in Canadian history. Jean Charest, another close ally of Brian Mulroney, saying that he was one of the greatest prime ministers in Canadian history. And we've also heard from Pierre Polyev, leader of the Conservative Party, who of course inherited part of that Brian Mulroney legacy. He says it is with great sadness that Canadians have learned of the loss of one of our greatest ever statesmen, the Right Honourable Brian Mulroney, and says that the only success uh, greater than his politics, perhaps, was his family. We're also hearing from the NDP tonight. This is what NDP MP Peter Julian had to say. Our, our thoughts are, are really with the family today, and though it is too early to know uh, what this will mean in terms of uh, uh, Parliament in the next few days and when we will be paying tribute to Mr. Mulroney, it is very clear by shutting down tonight that we are uh, honoring his, his legacy and his work on behalf of Canadians. Uh, Donna, one small tidbit to leave you with that was important to a lot of folks here on Parliament Hill. If someone who worked on the Hill, regardless of party lines or their family member was sick, they'd often get a phone call from Brian Mulroney, even while he was the Prime Minister, to check on how they were doing. So always a, a man of the people. A lovely personal touch. Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thanks. A sweeping year-long investigation by Global News has uncovered startling allegations that for-profit companies that operate group homes in Ontario's child welfare system may be targeting Indigenous kids to make more money. Our analysis also found Northern Children's Aid Societies serving communities with the fewest resources were charged the most to have their children in those group homes. As our chief investigative correspondent Carolyn Jarvis reports, the impact on Indigenous kids moved far from home can be Dramatic and lasting. The people you're about to hear from are blowing the whistle on how Indigenous kids are being treated by Ontario's child welfare system. The way that they used those kids as cash cows. 
they were legitimately a paycheck. Indigenous youth are being monetized. Global News spoke with more than 50 child welfare insiders who said they believe some for-profit group home companies in Ontario are targeting, or in some cases even charging more, to care for Indigenous kids. We have agreed to conceal their identities because they fear reprisal. It was all money. It was never ever about the youth. It was always about money. Group homes are supposed to be safe havens for kids and teens who may have come from abuse or have complex needs. In Ontario, more than 40% are operated by for-profit companies. Child welfare isn't child and family services. It's the consumption of children as assets because it brings them money. It's children's aid societies that place youth in group homes. A select few run their own, but most turn to outside operators. And as we uncovered, some agencies are charged more than others, with the highest daily rates billed to one group, Indigenous Children's Aid Societies in the North. It was about we need to recruit youth from up north. What was the talk? That we are aware that these youth can be difficult to place because of the limited resources in their communities. So they're willing to increase the cost of the contract because they have limited options. An exclusive analysis by Global News of how much children's aid societies in Ontario spent on group homes run by outside operators found that on average, Indigenous agencies in the North paid 26% more per child per day compared to non-Indigenous agencies across the province between 2012 and 2021. That translates to an estimate of nearly $28 million more over a decade. It's no different than the process of residential schools. They're taking them away from their families. They're taking them away from their culture. They're taking them away from their language. Non-Indigenous people are making money on the backs of these children. Megan Taylor was one of those children, moved nearly 2,000 kilometers south. It's very like scary too. It's like you're moving on a different planet. Every child placed in a for-profit group home comes with a contract, some worth over $1,000 a day per child. But what they received for that money varied greatly, according to former workers. Some homes offered support. Others were punitive and cold and devoid of culture. You weren't allowed to talk in your tongue. Staff would get mad, send you to your room, restrain you. The result, experts say, it's kids who pay the price. The system needs to know it's failing. The group homes we investigated all say they are not targeting or charging more for Indigenous youth and reject any comparison to residential schools. They say they work with a team of professionals and a child's guardian to ensure their cultural needs are met. Donna? Carol and Jarvis in Toronto, thanks. You can watch the full investigation in a special one-hour edition of The New Reality, The Business of Indigenous Children in Care, airs Friday night on Global. The dire situation in Gaza, where people are on the brink of starvation, got much worse today. According to witnesses, Israeli forces opened fire on people rushing to get aid coming in on trucks. A warning, the images are disturbing. Officials in Gaza say more than 100 people were killed, hundreds more injured in Gaza City. They accuse Israeli soldiers of shooting into crowds of civilians trying to reach a convoy of humanitarian aid. Israel says their troops did open fire, but that most of the dead were crushed, trampled or run over by the trucks as people rushed to get close. The death toll was already staggering. Gaza's health ministry, backed by Hamas, now says more than 30,000 Gazans have died in Israel's siege. Redmond Shannon on the reaction to what Israel's critics say is slaughter and starvation in Gaza. Dawn breaks over northern Gaza, revealing the aftermath of yet another horror. The dead and the injured dragged and carried from the scene to hospitals that barely function. This man and other witnesses say Israeli tanks fired on crowds that gathered before sunrise to get food from aid trucks. Hamas says Israeli forces killed over a hundred people. No IDF strike was conducted towards the aid convoy. An Israeli military spokesperson said Gazans ambushed an aid convoy run by a private contractor. Some began violently pushing and even trampling other Gazans to death, looting the humanitarian supplies. Israel says its troops only fired directly at those who ignored warning shots and approached Israeli tanks. 
Whatever the circumstances, the desperation among a population under siege is clear from Israeli drones above. The United Nations says it has not been able to deliver aid to northern Gaza in a week, an area where 300,000 people still live. In northern Gaza, where the operational space for humanitarian work is now almost zero, many are already believed to be starving. U.S. President Joe Biden said the deaths would complicate ongoing peace talks. I know. Elsewhere in Washington, the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says he believes that the number of women and children killed by Israel in Gaza since October 7th is over 25,000. That suggests the total number of deaths could be far higher than the Hamas figure of 30,000. Donna? Redmond Shannon in London, thank you. Israel has barred entry of food, water, medicine and other supplies, except for a trickle entering at the Rafah crossing and Israel's Karim Shalom crossing. Airdropping aid is the other option. Several countries have already done it with the help of the Jordanian Air Force. And now the Canadian government says it too hopes to airdrop humanitarian aid into Gaza in the coming days. Canada's international development minister recently travelled to the region and says the provision of aid to civilians is nowhere near what's needed. Preparations are underway for Alexei Navalny's funeral in Moscow tomorrow and colleagues of the Russian opposition leader say they can't find a hearse to carry his body. They say mortuaries are getting phone calls threatening them if they agree to transport Navalny's body. They also accuse Russian officials of blocking a larger memorial service. Today police were seen near the church and the cemetery where tomorrow's ceremony is planned. Navalny's supporters are promising to live stream it. The 47-year-old died in a Russian penal colony. His supporters blame Russian President Vladimir Putin. It's been more than eight months since the Titan submersible imploded. Coming up, for the first time, we hear the sounds that gave searchers hope. As of late tonight, Mexicans coming to Canada will need a visa to get in. The federal government is reimposing visa requirements that it lifted nearly eight years ago because there's been a flood of asylum claims from Mexicans. Taria Isri explains the about face. Mexican travelers were given less than 24 hours notice that visa free travel to Canada is ending. A key work Immigration helps. Minister Canadians Mark Miller announced the swift reversal. Claims. We want to make sure that people don't game the system. It has to come into effect quite quickly. The Liberals are bringing back the visa requirement they dropped in 2016. That year, there were 260 asylum claims from Mexico to Canada. Since then, that number has reached a record high, surging to almost 24,000 last year. Most asylum claims from Mexico are either rejected by the Immigration Refugee Board of Canada or withdrawn or abandoned by the applicant. And so a change was needed. Quebec, the main destination of Mexican asylum seekers, urged Ottawa to do this. Premier Francois Legault called it the right step, but asked, what do we do with the 160,000 asylum seekers we already have? We should have a visa with Mexico. The Harper government introduced the visa requirement for Mexicans in 2009. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev says it should have stayed in place. We have the social services and our housing market completely overwhelmed with false claimants. The Biden administration had warned human traffickers connected to Mexican cartels may be exploiting Canada's visa-free system as a backdoor to get into the U.S. The Mexican president is accusing Washington and Ottawa of acting unilaterally on immigration and is threatening to skip the upcoming Three Amigos Summit, which Canada is hosting this year. Taria Isri, Global News, Ottawa. A sweeping police crackdown on organized crime in Quebec has led to more than 30 arrests in the last week, and more are expected. Authorities say it's a blow to the Blood Family Mafia, a street gang believed to be behind a string of violent kidnappings. Mike Armstrong is in Quebec City with what police have revealed. Mike. Well, Donna, these are charge sheets for some of the people arrested over the last week in this region, almost all of them members of the same street gang. 
Right. Now, police are hesitant to talk about the Blood Family Mafia specifically, but at a press conference at Provincial Police Headquarters this morning, they did make it clear why they deployed hundreds of officers in recent days and raided 40 different locations. Well, a lot of these arrests are linked directly to the, uh, to the events that happened uh, last week. There were two very violent incidents. One was at this home south of Quebec City. Three men with links to the Hells Angels were kidnapped and tortured. The other incident was also the kidnapping of a man with links to the Hells. He was dropped off on the streets of Montreal after being tortured and mutilated. According to sources, the BFM gang is led by Dave Turmel. He's gone after the Hells after refusing to pay a 10% tax on drug sales in Hells-controlled territory. Surmel is believed to be right now hiding out in Europe. The suspects that we're looking for that are not in Quebec, we're working with different authorities. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Again, according to sources, the Hells used back channels to tell police they should take action against the BFM gang or things could get even uglier. Police insist they're not working with or supporting the Hells. They say it just happens that in these cases, it's people linked to the Hells Angels who are the victims. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Quebec City. Quebec's Court of Appeal has upheld the province's controversial Bill 21 in its entirety, a decision that quashes a legal challenge over its constitutionality and its protection through the notwithstanding clause. It's a great victory for all of those who support a uh, secular Quebec. It's especially a victory for Quebec's uh, liberty, Quebec's autonomy. The ruling also granted the province's appeal to overturn a lower court's decision exempting English school boards from the secularism law. Bill 21 prohibits public sector workers such as teachers, judges and police officers from wearing religious symbols on the job. Opponents say the law disproportionately targets and discriminates against Muslim women. Canada's long-awaited National Pharmacare bill was tabled in Ottawa today. Diabetes treatments and contraception will be covered to start. There are plans to eventually develop a universal single-payer system for other medications. It's meant to give Canadians better and cheaper access to medicine. Eric Sorensen reports on the work Ottawa and the provinces and territories must do to implement the program and get this legislation passed. For up to 9 million women and gender-diverse Canadians, cost has always represented a barrier to accessing birth control, from oral contraceptives to IUDs, morning-after pills, and more. And that's going to change. Today's announcement that contraception will now be free in Canada, or will be free soon, is an extraordinary historic win for reproductive rights. And for almost 4 million Canadians with diabetes, the steep cost of medication causes some to forego proper treatment. That could now change. A really monumental step forward. Laura Siren has diabetes and heads up the largest diabetes charitable organization in the country. She says the program aims to cover both drugs and devices to control diabetes. The right medication at the right time has a huge impact on, on outcomes. This motion is deemed adopted. Birth control and diabetes are the first two drug categories to be covered under the new Universal Pharmacare Bill. The federal health minister, Mark Holland, made a point of congratulating his NDP counterpart with whom he collaborated. Today is a giant step forward for our health system. It was made possible by two adversaries asking what we have in common rather than what separates us. Though New Democrats are concerned, the Liberal government will get the lion's share of credit for the program. It's happening because New Democrats fought and we forced the government to do this. For now, the challenge is getting the program off the ground. Alberta and Quebec already suggest they'll opt out of a national program. Holland says he's spoken with Quebec's health minister and Alberta's health minister. That conversation believe, um, leads me to believe that we can find answers, we can find solutions. We want to make sure that every Canadian and certainly every uh, Albertan uh, has access to universal contraceptives and to the diabetes medication they need. From costs that could run into the billions to how pharmacies will dispense the drugs, Ottawa says it will take a step-by-step -step approach. And this is just the first step. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. There are renewed calls tonight for transparency and accountability over the billions of dollars in federal spending that was doled out during the pandemic. Through access to information laws, Global News has uncovered evidence some Canadian companies were cut out of contracts and that Canadians may not have received the best price. David Aiken explains. Global News has learned that of the $5 billion that Ottawa spent on rapid tests during the pandemic, $2 billion went to one company, BTNX, for test kits made in China, while companies selling made-in-Canada kits were nearly shut out. 
Two years later, Ottawa still will not provide the data it has, which compares the prices of each manufacturer's test kit. And I will take you back to very difficult days when we were under extreme pressure to ensure that our country had the PPE, the rapid tests and the vaccines to survive. And what our plan was in the Government of Canada was to diversify supply chains. So we diversified our supply chains for every product. Jean-Yves Duclos is now the procurement minister, but during most of the pandemic, he was the health minister. And he too remembered the pressure to make quick purchasing decisions. Few people weren't, weren't able to leave their home, so we had significant needs for rapid tests. And at that time, we had not been able to procure many of them uh, to protect Canadians uh, in a time of crisis. New Democrats say that's no excuse now to avoid having an inquiry about those decisions. New Democrats believe Canadians deserve transparency and accountability on how their government handled every aspect of the pandemic. No stone should be left unturned. Even as questions remain unanswered about two-year-old pandemic spending, the government today tabled its spending plan for next year, 2024-2025, a plan to spend more than $449 billion. Donna? David Aiken in Ottawa tonight. Thanks. Canada's privacy commissioner has released the findings of an investigation into the company that operates Pornhub and other adult websites. Philippe Dufresne found the company violated privacy laws because it didn't make reasonable efforts to get consent for intimate images and made removing them difficult. The inadequate privacy protection measures on Pornhub and other ALO sites have led to devastating consequences for the complainant and other victims of non-consensual disclosure of intimate images. This must be addressed now. Dufresne says Pornhub's parent company has ignored recommendations to obtain valid consent when dealing with highly sensitive content. He says if companies don't comply, he could take action in court. In the U.S., nearly two weeks after Alabama's Supreme Court ruled embryos are people, there is new protection in place for doctors who provide IVF treatment. Alabama's state legislature voted to protect doctors from criminal or civil liability if embryos are damaged or destroyed. The legislation aims to provide clarity to fertility clinics that have stopped operating since the ruling. The unprecedented decision has left patients and practitioners in Alabama scrambling. The wildfire raging across Texas is now the largest in that state's history. The Smokehouse Creek fire has burned more than one million acres since Monday. Dozens of homes have been destroyed. One person has died. The fire is only 3% contained and the forecast is for a hot and windy weekend. Scaling back spending ahead, how Alberta's government says it's showing restraint in this year's budget. Alberta's finance minister has tabled the latest provincial budget. As expected, a promised tax cut has been delayed, but there will be a new tax on electric vehicles. The minister says his government is focused on what's saving for what could be a year of devastating fire and drought. Heather Urex West was watching the budget come down in Edmonton tonight. It is truly an honour to rise in the Assembly today and present Budget 2024. It's a budget with an eye on saving for a rainy day, with moderate increases in spending, $2 billion for disaster relief, and $2 billion heading straight to the bank. That brings Alberta's long-term savings account to $25 billion, an invaluable legacy that we are growing for the next generations. But it's not what the UCP government campaigned on last spring. This permanent billion-dollar tax cut will provide meaningful, timely tax relief to Albertans at a time when they need it most. That tax cut won't be implemented for two years, and only then if conditions allow. Alberta will remain free of a provincial sales tax, but there is a new tax coming if you own an electric car. While most provinces and the federal government are offering thousands of dollars in incentives to purchase EVs, Alberta owners will be taxed $200 every year. Since EV drivers obviously don't pay a fuel tax, 
This new tax will be their contribution to keep provincial roads maintained and to support other public services. I just find that this is a government that is always keen to make anybody doing anything to reduce emissions pay more or be told they can't do it at all. Weaning off its dependence on oil has become a central focus of this government, but we've heard this promise before. Two years ago, Premier Jason Kenney had pledged a massive $3 billion deposit, only to have that clawed back by almost $2 billion as soon as Danielle Smith took the reins. Donna? Heather, thanks. Next, when a promised everlasting gobstopper turns out to be a hornswoggle, the Willy Wonka event that led some parents to call the police. In Glasgow, Scotland, a Willy Wonka themed experience was billed as a place where chocolate dreams become a reality. It didn't quite turn out that way. I mean, maybe if you really used your imagination, there just wasn't much, certainly no chocolate. Families say their kids got half a cup of lemonade and two jelly beans each. You can imagine how that went over. Children were left in tears. It was such a letdown, some parents called the police. The British company behind the fiasco has no affiliation with Warner Brothers. Some of the actors hired for the event say artificial intelligence played a role in devising the chaotic script. Tickets cost about $60. The company has issued refunds to those who attended and say they won't be hosting any events for the foreseeable future. Well, the tragic end to the story of the Titan submersible made headlines around the world. It was a private mission carrying five people into the depths of the North Atlantic to the wreck of the Titanic. Now an audio recording of a knocking sound that gave rescuers hope has been released. Those sounds were detected by the Canadian Air Force off the coast of Newfoundland during last year's massive rescue mission. The audio has been released for a documentary about the submersible's ill-fated voyage. At the time, it was hoped those sounds came from passengers inside the submersible, but it was later determined the vessel had imploded, killing all five of them. We close today on our top story, the death of former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who has passed away at the age of 84. We leave you with a look at his political life in pictures. Mulroney spent decades in public life. He's survived by his wife, Mila, and four children. I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for watching.